Chapter 9 Your Tuition at Work Part 2 of 4 As Alexia attended her needs, Loki and the others exited the south side exit where Carter was supposed to be procuring a vehicle. Without Alexia being present, Conrad assumed temporary leadership. At least he tried to, but the two mares were not used to taking orders from anyone outside of Alexia or Thompson. And the director was only included in that very short list because it was their job and he had earned their respect. That wasn't to say Conrad didn't have their respect, it's just that instinctually they only answered to their alpha. It was an instinct the mares tried to ignore for the sake of the mission, but found it difficult to do so. Crimson was nearing her wit's end at being so close to so many Mayans and being unable to act against them. All of these damned cultists and species traitors and I can't do anything to them. While the pale yellow mare did her best to ignore the rising bile of being in such close proximity of several Mayans, and cantered outside behind Conrad and Loki. The rain was a constant and unwelcome companion as the trio marched to the far end of the parking lot. Loki looked to Conrad who seemed to know where he was going. What's the 411 acting alpha? He frowned at the green mare's snarky tone. Carter said they procured a white van and are waiting for us on the far west side of the admin building. So why are you the temporary boss? Crimson remarked more tersely than she meant to. Because I was her first mate that's why, he countered while turning a corner. Besides, without Alex around we need to act quickly. I don't like her being by herself. Crimson frowned, but remained silent. Loki huffed at the rain more than the stallion. Just saying we should have voted on it is all. The effects of a non-alpha trying to assume a leadership role over two strong-willed herd members was not well documented on Earth. In addition with all of them still being loyal to their current alpha, namely Alexia, the two Earth mares were finding it difficult to follow Conrad's orders after he nominated himself as the temporary leader. All of this could have been avoided if Alexia had thought to name one of them the temporary leader, but none of them knew that aspect about themselves. Nevertheless, the two earth mares kept their peace as the van came into view. It was an old thing with worn paint and a grumbling engine that didn't sound like it had many years left. Conrad scowled at it. Looks like the kind of vehicle I used to use for drug trafficking. The three men dared not show their faces lest their non-red toned skin be identified by any passers-by. The stallion pulled the sliding door and jumped inside with the mares following closely behind. The three men had been told to expect them, and that their appearance would be very different than before. Loi and Snake were still wary of the equines until they deactivated their perception scramblers and resumed their normal appearance. Loi felt most of his tension ease up as he whistled in amazement. When Toon said you guys had some good camo, she wasn't kidding. Snake, who was sitting in the passenger seat, grinned at Carter who was eyeing the ponies with envy. I bet you wish your agency had that kind of tech at. Carter said nothing on the subject and waited until the side door was closed to speak. Where's Toon? Loki had no shame and shook the water off of her like a dog. Those around her attempted to cover their faces from the watery onslaught. She's keeping the boss around here busy and is trying to get information out of her. The federal agent didn't like the Illicorn, but harbored no doubts about her loyalty to the states and humanity. I trust she can keep her true loyalties secret. Did you find any useful information on the map? Loki fished out a few copies of the charts she found and doled them out to everyone. There are a few places simply called Labs 1 through 5. I did manage to find out that Laboratory 5 is spiking its power consumption and has been ever since the 82nd started fighting in the south. Crimson piped in next after she scanned the map to locate Lab 5. I saw several dump trucks moving off towards that place a few minutes ago. But I couldn't tell what was in them thanks to the tarps over the cargo beds. Loi flicked some of the water Loki sprayed on him with a hand and tried his best to ignore mentioning it. I'd say that's as good a place as any to start looking. It may be a high traffic area, but I'm sure you guys can sneak in no problem right? Crimson was unsure. That depends entirely on whether or not there are ponies working there. We have bracelets that'll let us go unseen by the Mayans, but it doesn't work against other ponies. 
Carter shifted the van out of park and started driving towards the designated location. Then you had better hope your stealth training is up to par. Loki interposed herself between the two front seats. You just be sure to get us in close without drawing attention. I don't want to have to call evac when all we've got to show for our efforts is a map. The van fell in line with a few other cars and trucks that were going in the same general direction as the lab. Now that we're inside the parameter, getting there is easy. Getting inside is the tricky part. Asterisk. Alexia finished up with the bathroom and knocked on Hazel's office door. It was of heavy oak construction, but that barely registered to the mare thanks to her shod hooves. Come in, announced the familiar voice of the minister. Alexia did not speak right away. I hope deactivating the perception filter and reactivating it makes me look the same to her. The mayor stuck her head in to survey the office in an attempt to look suspicious. Hazel was in the middle of talking via telepathy to the military commander of the college's defenses when she saw the pony reveal herself. I'll get back with you later Bumha. An important guest has arrived. Hazel severed the telepathic link with her subordinate. Redfield. Would you kindly have a seat please? Will you, good. I still look the same. Um, sure. You got any grub by chance? Hazel expected that request from a comment she heard earlier. I took the liberty of having a couple bowls of dragon soup brought up here. Since you're a pegasus, I had some beef thrown in as well. The woman pointed to a large covered silver dish sitting on the left side of her mahogany desk. She lifted the cover to reveal two steaming bowls of a rather exquisite smelling broth. Alexia didn't have to try hard to play the part of the hungry pony. Dragon soup. We have a special fungus that we've recently begun cultivating. It tastes rather bland to us Mayans, but I hear nothing but good things about it from ponies. Add some basil, a little garlic salt. Alexia's first instinct was to levitate the spoon, but she managed to catch herself before activating her hidden horn. Although the ivory spire upon her head would remain invisible, the azure glow it would emit would be seen through the disguise. Not to mention a floating spoon in front of a pegasus would draw some attention. The disguised alicorn sat in the larger of the two guest chairs and wrapped her forelegs around the bowl to bring it over. She sniffed it experimentally. The broth had an extremely heady aroma. There could be anything in this soup. She thought suspiciously. I don't suppose you'd tell me if there was some mind control drug in here would you? The woman adopted a coy grin. My, aren't we the cautious one? I'll admit we do have to use some methods of chemical persuasion on human aligned ponies every now and again, but there's no need for that here. If it's all the same. Alexia put the bowl back on the desk. I've lost my appetite. Hazel's tone of voice cooled. If it will put your mind at ease I'll eat from the same bowl. The alicorn's suspicion was on the rise. Whatever drug you put in there could only be effective in larger doses than a spoonful or may not affect Mayans at all. When the woman's eyes narrowed infinitesimally, Toon knew she was right. It appears you're no better than the humans. At least they have the decency to be hostile to your face. The mare jumped out of her seat and turned to the door. I'll be leaving now. Before she could open the door, an electric lock sealed the exit and the sound of a pistol's hammer being cocked reached her ears. I'm afraid you're not going anywhere. Alexia turned away from the door with a condescending smirk on her face. So. This is how you get recruits, hey? Either by drug or by force. Hazel's visage and tone of voice redefined what it meant to be snide. You didn't really expect us to believe a group of civilian ponies would just happen to wander past all of our northern sentries and straight to the college did you? The silver mare huffed with indifference and dropped all pretense of being a non-combatant. Maybe you should train them better then. Hazel wore smugness as if it came naturally to her. I believe they serve their function just fine. I've already given word to the campus to detain your companions. You may not be capable of joining the link, but there's nothing a few days of psychic persuasion can't cure. Ponies usually last a week or so before they fully believe our methods are in the right. For you though, I'd say no more than ten days. 
Alexia snarled hatefully at the threat. So, is that how you force ponies into joining you? You wipe their minds until they see your truth. Not all of them, Hazel replied mockingly. It's actually uncommon to have more than one or two be re-socialized a month. Many just know which way the wind's blowing. Even if we fail to fully destroy humanity, by the time the quarry dust arrive, they will be too weak to mount anything more than token resistance. Our victory is assured. The minister stood up while keeping her pistol aimed right at Alexia's head. A victorious toothy smirk creased her features. And when that day comes, those brethren of yours who sided with us will be rewarded greatly for their allegiance. But don't feel too bad. Even if it's being forced upon you, you will still share in that reward. That'll be the day. Alexia gripped the pistol in her magic and forcibly wrenched it out of Hazel's hands. Before the woman could even register that a Pegasus was using telekinesis, Alexia flipped the pistol around and shot the Mayan in the forehead. Alexia immediately scanned the room for any listening devices and found four. I bet there are a few more that I can't sense. Toon shuffled her disguise to appear as a different pony, but kept the Pegasus appearance. Then she guesstimated the distance between herself and the roof. Nothing like a blind teleport to elevate your blood pressure. I can't go through the door because I'm sure she has back up. With a flash of azure light Alexia blinked from the office and back into the freezing rain twenty feet above the roof. The alicorn dove towards the steeple to avoid the attention the flash of light would undoubtedly bring. The steeple itself was wide enough for her to hide behind while she clicked her radio to speak with her mates. Guys, we got a problem. Loki was just about to step outside of the van when the call came in. Everyone in the team heard it. The green mare stepped back from the door while Carter responded back. What's the situation? Alexia was shivering from the cold rain, but she preferred it over the office she had just left. The locals weren't fooled. They're on the lookout for us and will be on high alert. Loki glanced at the others in the van. Do we abort? Snake scowled at the idea. Like hell we do. My brothers didn't die back there just for us to back off now. Carter was more cautious. If we try to fight our way in, we could be cornered, killed, or worse. I do not want to end up as some redskin zealot. Alexia decided to satisfy both sides. Listen to me. Where are you guys right now? Lab 5, just north of the old she checked the map to be sure, Barnwell Chapel. Alexia pressed herself against the steeple to stay hidden from a small flock of Pegasi patrolling the skies. The grounds below were in a uproar and one group of people started hunting for her immediately while a second group of guards were mustering to form search parties. The Alicorn let the flock of three Pegasi pass by her before using her magic to forcibly lull the third one in the group to sleep while pulling the falling mare's identification helmet off of her and reeled it back in before the stricken pony's wingmates could notice what happened. Toon got an idea and shared it over the radio. Okay I got a plan. I'm going to lure everyone to the south with some personal pyrotechnics. When everyone's attention is to the south, you guys sneak in the lab and pull what info you can. Conrad was completely against the idea. Alexia. We can't risk that. You'd be all alone with no backup. I can handle myself Conrad, she replied calmly. All I'm going to do is lure everyone towards me to keep their attention away from you. Give me two minutes to get started before you rush in. Loey knew the stallion was on the verge of jumping out of the van and flying over to his alpha. He placed a restraining hand on the Pegasus's withers. We'll call in the second evac choppers so they'll be on standby. In the meantime we pick up some lab coats and set this place up for an airstrike on our way out. Carter didn't like it but he wasn't going to waste this opportunity. If she's so bound and determined to throw herself into the fire, then we might as well make use of it. He joined back into the conversation. We'll move in 60 seconds. Make it flashy Zeta-1. Alexia secured the stolen helmet on her head and made sure the scramblers didn't disguise it as well. I can do flashy. With the conversation over, Alexia focused on the necklace she always wore and on the malleable gem it contained. 
just need to make my contingency plan first. It took her 30 seconds to weave the spell she wanted into the gem. And my magic students thought I couldn't mentally recreate an array. Right, let's get the show on the road. Alexia looked down at the assembly of guards, both Mayan and Pony, assembling in the yard. The heavy rain and darkening skies cast them in that eerie gloom before what few streetlights the area had would be turned on. The sight of them made the alicorn's visage become that of a predator. The azure-crowned pony felt the urge to sing and she was more than happy to satisfy that urge. My my, so much rain, so much water, so so very much hydrogen and oxygen. Just whatever shall I do with it all? Toon's smile turned venomous as a pale azure source less light enveloped the detachment of forty guards while their commander barked out orders to form ranks. Alexia was quite familiar with the principle behind electrolysis. As a result, she required very little mana in splitting the water molecules falling onto the group of guards. Over the course of ten seconds, much of the water split apart into its two elements and were concentrated within the azure light. It took another five seconds before some of them started to notice the ground was drying out and the rain was thinning around only them. Shouts of surprise and alarm reached Alexia's ears and that was when she pulled the thermal energy out of the commander and concentrated it into a ball. As she compressed the ball of thermal energy, it grew hotter and hotter. Right as the Mayan commander dropped to the ground as a frozen icicle, the sphere had compressed enough to spark the hydrogen. The resulting explosion was so bright and loud that it momentarily brought pause to everyone on campus who was either outside or near a window facing the administration building. Flames licked at the roof of the building and danced across the thermal barrier surrounding the vengeful alicorn. She started singing again as she found a collection of Mayans and ponies fleeing the scene. Hush now little ones don't say a word. A second explosion wiped them from existence at the same time a third group caught her eye. Mama's going to buy you a mockingbird. Alexia took to the air to get a better view on the parked cars. The rain tried to beat her back down to the ground, but she ignored the stress of trying to fly in the rain to continue her work. And if that mockingbird won't sing. Toon lifted one of the sedans in her magic and surrounded it with a pocket of hydrogen and oxygen gas. Mama's gonna buy you a diamond ring. The alicorn ignited the volatile gas and wreathed the car in flames. Then she used her telekinesis to throw it into the south wing of the administration building. She repeated this twice more with a pickup truck and a SUV in different spots so when the fuel tanks blew it would cause damage in multiple places. Before she could begin the next verse of her singing poem, the innate kinetic shields of her necklace flickered as three gunshots hammered into them, dropping all but the final barrier. Alexia utilized her larger wingspan to push herself further up into the air as two of the Pegasi she had stolen the helmet from were closing in on her with two Mayans on the ground firing assault rifles. Toon immediately summoned a massive kinetic bleed field. Everything within twenty feet of her slowed to an absolute crawl. She waved a mocking hoof towards the incoming Pegasi. Come on boys. I'm waiting. Like smacking to a tub of molasses, the two Pegasi's snouts made it through the field before slowing down considerably. Unfortunately for them, the rest of their body kept moving and the duo nearly broke their jaws on a head-on collision. Gravity pulled the two ponies to the ground below a few moments later. Well it seems Hazel got the word out about my fake appearance faster than I thought she did. Suits me just fine. Something heavy and wet started pressing down on her horn causing Alexia to look up. A vast pool of water 20 feet across and 3 feet deep was collecting in her kinetic field and it was getting large enough that gravity was winning over the spell. The collected water was fixating everyone's attention on her as the oddity of its presence was too conspicuous to ignore. Well now. Isn't that just a big bomb waiting to happen? A few bolts of light nearly hit her as several unicorns started firing on her from the ground. Alexia huffed and used her kinesis to open a hole in the pond above her head and flew through it to get on top. As soon as she was above it, she turned around to resume hovering. I hope you bastards can swim. With a snickering dark laugh, she released the kinetic spell, and the torrent of water fell upon those below. Surf's up. Asterisk. End of part two.